In the die casting process, the reusable steel dies, or molds, are preheated and coated with a die release agent to lubricate and protect the surfaces of the dies before each use. Next, pre-measured amounts of molten metal are injected into the dies at extremely high pressures. The newly formed part is then removed from the dies and the cycle is repeated after the die cools. The ones that are often used for die casting are zinc, aluminum, magnesium, and brass alloys. As technology advances and computerized automation in the field increases, we will be seeing even more light metal components in the future. These dies can be engineered to produce complex shapes with a high degree of accuracy and repeatability. Dies can be used many thousands of times, so the die casting process is used when very large quantities are needed. Die cast parts can be sharply defined with smooth or textured surfaces and are suitable for a wide variety of finishes. This high pressure process produces a dense, fine grained surface structure with a wide range of physical and mechanical properties such as fatigue strength. Injection molding is the most common method for mass manufacturing plastic products. Examples include chairs, toys, cases for consumer electronics, disposable cutlery, and my favorite, Lego bricks. In principle, injection molding is simple. Melt plastic, inject it into a mold, let it cool, and then out pops a plastic product. In reality, injection molding is an intricate and complex process. An injection molding machine has three main parts. The injection unit, the mold, and the clamp. Plastic pellets in the hopper feed into the barrel of the injection unit. Inside the barrel, a screw transports the pellets forward. Heater bands wrapped around the barrel warm up the plastic pellets. As the pellets are moved forward by the screw, they gradually melt and are entirely molten by the time they reach the front of the barrel. Once enough molten plastic is in front of the screw, it rams forward like the plunger of a syringe. 
In a matter of seconds, the screw injects the molten plastic into the empty part of the mold called the cavity image. The plastic solidifies in under a minute. The mold opens and the part is ejected. The mold then closes and the process repeats. All injection molded objects start with these plastic pellets, which are a few millimeters in diameter. They can be mixed with small amounts of pigment called colorant or with up to 15% recycled material then fed into the injection molding machine. Removing the part from the mold can be difficult. When the plastic cools, it shrinks and so becomes stuck tightly on the core half of the mold. Molds have built-in ejector pins that push the part off the mold. The ends of the pins sit flush with the core half of the mold, but are not perfectly aligned. Sometimes they protrude or are indented slightly. So, if you look closely, you will see circular ejector pin witness marks on molded products. For example, this chair on its bottom has an array of witness marks. When the part drops from the mold, an operator has to remove the sprue, that section of plastic that connected the injection unit to the mold. Sprues are manually twisted or cut off the part. Sprues are attached to objects only in molds that make a single part at a time, like a chair. Smaller objects are made in multiples in a single mold. In these, the sprue connects not to the part itself, but to a network of distribution tunnels called runners. The runners fan out from the sprue and connect to each cavity in the mold via a small, typically rectangular, entrance called the gate. You can see the gate on plastic cutlery. The parts for model planes typically come still attached to their runners. Molds always have at least two parts, and where the parts of the mold meet is called the parting line. Here on this piece of cutlery, you see the parting line along the side of the fork. When mold halves close, they are never perfectly aligned, nor do they have sharp corners. This creates a noticeable parting line on the molded object. Another very important aspect of mold design is the draft angle. If a part has walls that are exactly 90 degrees, it will be very difficult to eject because its inner walls will scrape the core half of the mold. Also, the vacuum will be difficult to break because air cannot readily enter. However, if the walls are slightly tapered, even just one or two degrees, it becomes much easier for the part to be removed because once the part moves slightly, the walls are no longer in contact with the core half and air can rush in. Look around you and see how many injection molded objects you can find. Likely the device you're watching this on has injected molded parts. You should be able to find ejector pin witness marks and parting lines, but you may find something like this. It's a date wheel that shows the month and year the item was made. These are created by removable inserts and can be changed out for each run of the mold. They're very useful for tracking down defects. This video shows in simple steps the correct way to vacuum form. Vacuum forming is an easy manufacturing method used to create hollow plastic products. To put it simply, a sheet of thermoplastic is heated from above. Once malleable, meaning soft and flexible, the heat is removed. A mould is raised into the plastic from below. Finally, the air is vacuumed out from below, forcing the malleable plastic onto the mould and making the plastic take the shape of the mould. To begin, you will need a sheet of plastic, usually high impact polystyrene, a mould to vacuum form, and a vacuum forming machine. There are a number of different parts to the vacuum former. The vacuum on and off switch and reverse lever which start the vacuum and gives a short reverse burst of air to release the mould after forming. The toggle clamps which hold the plastic sheets firmly in place when heating and forming. The platen which is the platform the mould sits on. The heater and heat controls which can be pulled over the plastic sheet to heat it. And the platen lift, this lowers and raises the platen platform. To begin the process, you must first make sure the mould is finished properly. This means all the edges are smooth and rounded and the sides are tapered, meaning angled at at least 5 degrees. This is to ensure the mould can be released from underneath the plastic after forming. Additionally, if there are any cavities in the mould, like in this example, a small hole must be drilled from the cavity to the bottom of the mould. These are called vent holes. They are used to help pull the last of the plastic sheets into corners where the original vacuum will not reach. You are now ready to vacuum form. Start by turning the machine on. You may have to flip two switches, one for the heater and one for the vacuum. Next, place the mould onto the platen and lower the mould using the platen lift. 
Get your plastic sheets and clamp, clamp it tightly over the mould using the toggle clamps. Make sure it's held tight and there are no gaps around the edges for any air to escape. Now pull the heater over the plastic sheet and turn the heater knobs on. You can adjust the amount of heaters and their heat to match the size and thickness of your plastic sheets. You must heat your plastic until it becomes soft and begins to sag. Heated plastic follows three steps. Firstly it will become very hot. It will then begin to wrinkle and finally it will sag. You must be careful at this point as the material will be very hot. Also you must not heat the plastic sheets too much as they may melt. The best way to check your plastic is to pull the heater back every 30 seconds and lightly tap the sheet. When it becomes very easy to press and bounces back slightly it's ready. Turn the heater off and pull back. Be very careful during this step as there can be a number of hot surfaces around. You must now raise your mould using the platen lift until it locks in place. Flip the vacuum on and off switch and watch carefully as the plastic is forced onto your mould. When the plastic has tightly covered your mould, use the reverse lever to separate the two. Give the plastic enough time to cool down as it will still be very hot. Release your moulds from the vacuum former using the toggle clamps and turn the machine off. Finally, being very careful, you can use a sharp knife and a cutting board to cut the excess plastic from your mould. Congratulations, you now have a perfect vacuum formed mould. In this video, we explain how to laser cut non-metals, such as acrylic or wood, with Trotec CO2 lasers. Laser cutting is a thermal separation method in which many different materials can be cut efficiently, quickly and precisely, and without reworking. This is how quickly you get from the graphics to the finished workpiece. For laser cutting, you first need an idea which will determine the desired cutting geometry and the material. The graphic is created in a vector program such as Coral Draw on the computer and the data are simply sent to the laser cutter via a print command. For example, an acrylic plate is placed on the processing table and the start button is pressed. The material does not have to be clamped and also nothing has to be modified at the device. The laser is a tool for everything. The finished workpiece can be removed as soon as the laser process is completed without reworking. What actually happens in the laser device? The laser head traces the vector image and cuts the design out. In detail, it looks like this. If the laser impinges the material with low power, only one layer is removed, thus engraved. If the power is increased, the laser beam cuts through the material. No reworking is necessary to achieve flame polished cutting edges on acrylic. The laser can cut a wide array of materials such as acrylic, wood, laminates, films, signs, paper and much more. printing is a technology that lets you take a digital file and turn it into a physical product. Almost anything you can imagine people are creating. I think it's going to open up whole new opportunities in areas of mass customization. Unlike with music or movies, with a 3D printer a lot of things that are printed aren't protected by copyright. One of the really cool things about 3D printing is it really changes the dynamic of a consumer culture.